Thanks, Julie, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this morning. Thank you particularly to Nico Fiquette Perez. I, <laughs> I've been practicing his surname, Fiquette Perez. Um, Nico is going to talk to us this morning about energy efficiency. He's an environmental health and safety specialist, but probably with a bigger E, um, with interest in sustainable finance and IT. Uh, he's working as a consultant for Hillmont Associates, mostly in the area of integrated management systems. He works internationally, but now lives in Switzerland. He's got roots in Hungary and Spain. And so we're really delighted to have him as a true European in our European branch. He's going to talk Thank about so energy much, this morning. Um, he's looking at practical tips for managing, um, technical tips, operational solutions. So hoping to get some really good ideas. I told my son about this talk, this webinar this morning at breakfast, and he said, everyone's going to be really interested. Everyone wants to save money. I kind of wish he'd also said that everyone wants to save the planet, but both are very true. So it makes it a great topic um, for our, our webinar. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what Nico has to say. So over to Nico and thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. Thank you so much, Julie, and welcome, everyone. So I wanted to design this webinar today with a bit of interaction. And so I have a few questions for you during the webinar that you can answer on the chat box. But at the same time, I want to keep it short and I want to keep it for lunchtime and for everyone in, in, in the UK 11 Cs. So it doesn't take that much of your time, but I hope it's interesting for you. The first one, I want you to think, what is the energy budget? For a multinational, one in percentage, and how much for an SME. In the meantime, I'm going to run through a couple of the slides. So today, I'm going to try to define what what is energy efficiency. We're going to speak about what are the macro factors, so you can include that in your uh, macro thinking, pestle analysis, or whatever you do in each one of your organizations. We're going to see a bit of the policy context, but in general, everyone is going on the same direction, and there are changes that are really per region. So I will try to also smooth that out for everyone so you have an idea of how to strategize. Then we have organizational challenges, and that is really given by the experts. And let's think about some solutions, because if we're not here for solutions, what we're we doing here, right? Let's go to uh, today's definition. So energy efficiency, actually, it's not a that easy to define. Uh, I have here definitions from the European Union. I have definitions here from the International Energy Agency. I have here definitions from the OECD. And I have here definitions from ISO. So as you can see, the real, really the idea is to reduce energy waste, wastage. But at the same time, we have to think about what is our input and what is our output. And that will surprise you today with some of the figures I will present. So let's go back to that initial question. So this is what a multinational could be spending on energy on an annual basis. Why is that? It depends on the type of company they are. If they are more service orientated, it will be to the lower side of the scale. If more industrial orientated, it may be to the other side. If the supply chains are complex, they will need a lot of fuel. Therefore, they will be to the higher side and so on and so forth. For an SME, it actually the impact of of that is not only what type of industry they're in, but also the price of electricity. And that varies across regions a lot. So let's go back into the macro factors. The price of energy makes companies very sensitive to energy saving. So when the price goes up, they have an incentive. When the price goes down, they kind of forget it. And we have seen that as well with environmental management. We see it quite, quite often. In some regions, especially in Africa, in the Middle East, and also, for example, in Southeast Asia, fuel subsidies are very common. In actual fact, there is some research that says that every time an election is coming on, the fuel subsidies goes up, then after the election, the election they come down a bit. But usually, a fuel subsidies are a way to have a positive effect on the economy. When the price of energy is cheap, production comes up because people have more disposable income, companies as well, therefore they buy more. 
we are all going into net zero legislation. Many, many countries in the world are actually going towards that situation. However, since the COVID, there has been a huge increase in fuel poverty in households. And that probably is a new item in the agenda that has come up in the last few years. So the price of energy has gone up and many people are suffering that. Therefore, consumption is affected and companies are feeling the pinch. So let's think about how much money is spent on thinking about energy efficiency and annual clean energy. One of the biggest changes that you can see in this graph is the electric vehicles. A lot of investment is going to that. Then there is also the low carbon fuels and carbon capture. I don't know if you have heard a lot of that sentence that says clean coal. Well, clean coal really is just adding some carbon capturing on the same for gas and other type of dirty energies. So then we can actually have a lower impact in the environment. However, we're going to see that is not truly true. Then uh, the grids need to be upgraded to be able to reduce wastage of energy. And then we have to think about energy efficiency in business, investment on in nuclear, that in different countries is going different directions. Do not think that because we are feeling here in Europe that we are de-investing in nuclear, that is happening everywhere else. And then one of the biggest changes as well is renewable power that is growing because the technology is getting better. Now, we're thinking here we spend 1,400 billion US dollars. And you will think, oh gosh, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of opportunity there. But let me show you how much we actually need to spend. So what drives efficiency for organizations? If the infrastructure is improved, that actually creates efficiencies automatically for any organization then we have to think about investor demands and the level of legal compliance that we're having. We are all, most of the big companies now have to start counting emissions and they actually have to present being to the UK, to the European Union, in China, here in Switzerland as well, we all have to present what are our emissions and how we're complying with the legal demands. Now, the price of technology as well has a big influence on how organizations will adopt it. Do think the service companies, which are a bit more simple in what they need to adopt, in comparison with a big industrial organization that has many stages in the process and that they have many parts that they have to assemble together. Complexity is a big thing. And when you bet in one technology, you will have a problem if you want to change later on because they have come something that is more efficient for your organization. So all these bets that companies have to do, they have to be very well thought at the design stage. So always think when I'm thinking about efficiency for an organization, 80% is design, 20% is execution. And then later you sit down and collect the data. One of the biggest pushes for the emissions and efficiency is the use uh, um, emissions, trading, emissions trading system. So the ETS actually takes a number of allocations for very polluting industries, and they actually reduce every year the amount of allocations. They give a number of them to certain companies, 47% are allocated free, to a company, to the number of companies. And then the other ones are actually sold for companies that actually cannot comply for different reasons because they have a spike in production because there is a spike on demand. Or for example, um, you know, they actually have, they don't need so many, so they give back to the system and they are sold at auctions. That system actually has proven very good. However, the price of carbon is on the price. At the moment, it's about 102 euros per ton. Now, you will think that that's a big improvement since the system started at 25 euros. However, that is actually not the real price of carbon because what's the price of pollution? And the price of pollution is much higher if people don't have fresh air to breathe, for example. And then, of course, you know, you get acid rain, which will bring it into water bodies and also soil, soil contamination. Now, another change in policy is how you pay for pollution. So, do you have a carbon tax? And in some countries, we actually have an emission trading scheme 
the ETS. So in some countries, we actually have both, especially in Europe, Canada, and Mexico at the moment have both Japan as well. In any case, how is what is the best policy option is different for every country. Carbon taxes are applied direct, directly to the bill, or they are actually applied directly to companies, like in China, when they say, eh, okay, we have polluted this amount, and then we are declaring it. And self-declarations, as you know, may work, but also may not work. Some companies may declare what is actually correct. Some companies may actually declare what they want. And we find ourselves thinking, well, actually, how can it be with that million, millions of products produced, you're actually emitting so little? So it depends on the system, really. A carbon tax is probably a preferred one, but a mix of the two may actually be very successful on giving that push and drive for companies to change the way they do things. Let's not forget the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goal, or SDG 7, is saying the transition to the low carbon affordable energy for all will be expensive. At the moment, there are about 2 billion people out of the, the, the billions that we are that actually do not have access to energy. And low carbon, forget it. A lot of people still depend on burning really solid, solid biomass to actually create heat and cook for themselves. And this is even a case for some companies. So actually, we are still looking at how much will that cost. So here I have for you a few of the milestones that we have. At the moment, as I said, the big push in the agenda is to take households off fuel poverty. Few, phasing out subsidies is a major point for uh, international organizations, but actually at lo a national level, that is proving much more difficult. And then as well, the efficiency in major polluters, cement, steel, and transport which actually take over 60% of the emissions worldwide. However, do think that these are really primary materials that go later into buildings, that go into infrastructure and so on. And part of those industries actually have a supply chain that also is very energy intensive. And then we cannot forget the developing countries agenda. There's a lot of countries that will need whatever energy they have available. In many cases, it's carbon, gas, and oil to actually power that transformation into a bigger uh, developed country. In 2030, in reality, is when we want to have our carbon emissions controlled, so we do not go over the 1.5 degrees centigrade limit that the international organizations want. Actually, that's going to be very, very difficult. It's a tall order because we're already in 1.7 although it depends on the years. So we will have to wait until 2030 to see what developments and types of investment we need. In one of the slides before, I show you that we are spending 1,400 1, billion USD on that transformation. However, we need 12 trillion USD from now until 2030. So actually, once again, are we on the spending a bit? To put it into perspective, how much is those trillions in actual money? To give you an idea, the world GDP in 2019, I repeat, the world GDP in 2019 was 89 trillion US dollar. We need 12 trillion for that transformation. Let me give you another comparative number. Every three years, every three years, the US, US Army spends 2 trillion. 2 trillion every three years. So what we need between now and 2030 at the global level actually looks like a lot, but is not, uh, is not actually being materialized. And that has been a complaint in uh, Glasgow, where was very present the level of developing uh, countries not paying what they needed to be paying since they have the opportunity to develop on clean, dirt, oh, sorry, in dirtier fuels, which now we're demanding developing countries not to develop on. And that is a big discussion. We're not going to go into it. We want 40% of renewals in the mix. And then the idea is that by 2050, if we start achieving 
uh, those investments of 12 trillion, then we're looking at 5.9 trillion a year. So invest early to actually start saving money later. We think that from 2045 onwards, we could start saving about 5 trillion USD a year with these energy efficiency measures that we will take. So there is another big thing that I want to mention. A lot of what we know today as being our economic model has to change. For example, I give you a big example. A lot of the companies that sell us energy are actually pitched against each other to compete on price. They buy energy from the grid. They have to be very lean companies. And with that, they can actually start competing in the market with the price of electricity. For them, it's very good to have big customers. Big customers consume more and actually they can sell it for less money. However, we're gonna see a change on that. We need to give, and uh, we have to face out subsidies and this kind of competitive edge in the energy system, because otherwise we don't give what companies need, the drive, the need for efficiency that they need on their systems to actually change the economic model on that sense. So, this is not really materialized yet. We speak a lot about circular economy. We are doing a lot towards it, but we need to do more. So this is something I want you to have present when we see the policy context and how that is going to change towards 2030 and onwards. And depending where we are standing in 2030, we're gonna see the, the changes. Now, very interestingly, that will change some of the land masses that we have. Let's think about the Sahara Desert. The Sahara Desert, everyone sees this as well, a piece of land. However, in the Sahara Desert, there is so much potential to have photovoltaic. And in some cases, and in some areas, we actually can have even wind energy. So that it will reevaluate or give a new value to those lands. And that could be a very good point for developing countries. Now, we're going to go very quickly. Later, you can access the slides. I, I gave them to the Institute to share with everyone. I, I want to go to certain points of uh, what is your energy mix. When you know what your energy mix is, you can actually control that kind of emissions to scope, uh, sorry, the scope two of the emissions, about how much emissions you have. And when you know what is available to you, you actually can change the mix. There is no rocket science here. You must have heard a lot about it. Uh, but what is available in your area? And actually, when you start thinking about the supply chain and when you start thinking operations that you may have in other countries, you may find yourself with very different mixes. And when together put together for your annual report, you will find that maybe you're going a bit dirtier than you would like to and emitting much more than you want. So here you have how each one of these energy energy sources work. We're not going to go through it, but we're going to think about what is renewable and not. So en nuclear energy may be very good because the only release they have is a steam. However, they do have radioactive waste. Gas has been uh, sent to us as a big replacement for coal. So usually gas and petroleum go together because they are taken from the same areas. So for some countries that is very cheap because they can actually just get it there and have a lot of energy produced. And the good things about gas and coal is that when you have a spikes on demand of energy, you can actually comply with those demands. For example, nuclear cannot do that. Nuclear is very good for the base, but to actually increase the generation capacity, it may take turning on another line or turning off another a line of nuclear and that actually may take months with gas and coal listen do we need more let's just put more into the system we generate more we can export more to the grid so you have to have a uh, um, um, a balance between what is your base load and what is your peak load and that we can be doing it very well with gas and coal so you need it on the mix Gas and coal are not clean. They're, they're both in, they really have a big impact on the greenhouse gases, gas, methane, four times the potential of carbon dioxide for uh, polluting on the atmosphere and staying over for many more years. So for coal, for example, carbon dioxide stays 20 years, that's the calculation, whereas methane stays 80 years. So look at this graphic. In this graphic, we have actually the portions of the global 
emission, uh, sorry, global generation and what was consumed in each type of energy. We see that solar, biomass, geothermal, nuclear, they can generate a lot of energy that actually later may not be used. Then the same for coal, we can generate much more that we later use when it's in the grid. And then when you see the oil and gas, uh, you will see that the generation is very small, but the usage is very big. And that's because it's mostly used in transport. Oil and gas are fuels that can be transported. They are very used. And for caloric value, they are the best that we have right now. There's a lot being spoken about hydrogen, but to start hydrogen plants, we need a lot of energy first to get it started, and then only we can get energy from the grid to split those atoms. So there's still a lot of research to go into hydrogen, but it may become viable in the next few years. If that happens, once again, like nuclear, the only release that they have is steam. Oil, petroleum is still used as a mix in several countries. The power density is very high, it's not renewable, and biomass, well, that can be waste, wood chips, and any other solid fuel. Uh, in some cases, animal fat can be also used as a fuel. However, biomass and biofuels have had uh, some bad press, and fairly enough, because especially biofuels, you have, you have actually distorted the price of certain food uh, maize, for example, algae, etc., that later are used to do biofuels. So then when biofuels pay more, what happens is that the price of food goes over and that is actually not very good for humans. Hydro is very good, it's renewable, yes. However, there are some cons faced. The first one is that it's limited in availability. Not everyone can have hydro. So desert of Sahara, you cannot have hydro. Uh, it can be costly to build, so not every country has the money to do that upfront investment, and then it's prone to climate change. And if there is any drought periods, the hydro will generate not electricity. So you have there a huge piece of infrastructure that actually is not generation more. Now, let's go to the greenhouse gas emissions. Here you can see it very crystal clear. Coal, oil, natural gas are extremely big polluters. We still need oil and natural gas for our uh, transports. So, so far that is not going to change. So we have to look at alternative at including or sorry, uh, maximizing the other ones that we have. Nuclear energy uh, for many countries, US, Argentina and China, they're still big, big generators of the energy base load and it's very important to have them. Then you have wind that can, uh, that wind mills are actually becoming extremely, extremely good at generating electricity. However, they have some limitations. One of the big ones is that they can only work well at certain speed limits that you don't find everywhere. We all know the case of Denmark that have a lot of offshore wind generation. It looks very pretty. They do very well, but because in that spot you have the right amount of wind at the right speed, nearly constant, that actually works for you. So to put it into, con into context, one, one line of nuclear energy can generate over a gigawatt of energy. You will need exactly 165, 165 of the biggest available windmills to actually generate the same energy that one line of nuclear can generate. Once again, wind, solar, nuclear have very little impact, so we have to think about that. But the energy mix is very important. Geothermal also, uh, it can be fantastic. Now there is technology that I, you can actually have geothermal if you're in the right place and um, you can actually have it for your own building and do not depend on the grid for that. And in actual fact, you can actually export to the grid and get some money for it. So that will be a big incentive for many organizations. So how does it work? There are the crust of the earth where you are, a few meters down, you actually have a constant temperature. And what they do is to do boreholes, put water, that water generates a steam, that steam concentrates in that borehole, and with a turbine, it generates, uh, it generates electricity connected to a generator. It's cheap, it's local, you can have many sizes from very localized to actually big, big uh, produ production of it. 
but as I said, it's very local. It doesn't happen everywhere. It is renewal, yes, because mostly is eternal. There is always going to be like that. The temperature in the crust of the air is quite constant, summer, wind, and, and winter. Solar is very good. However, the technology of solar, actually the photovoltaic, does not absorb all of the sun radiation. In actual fact, the problem that you have is that while the sun radiates, you can use that energy, but later when it stops, you don't have any energy. So now they have sorted that in, in storage. Storage can be done with hot water or with batteries. Mind you, when you think about batteries and the same for electric vehicles, you actually have to think about the cost of the minerals. And the cost of the minerals also affects the availability of solar for certain countries and certain regions and the cost of it. And wind is also, as we said, uh, can have a content of rare earths in some of the parts that go into it. Rare earths are minerals that are mined and they are very uncommon, so sometimes are very difficult to recycle. So we are going to see a change on how uh, ownership of things are. And for many companies that have access to those rare earth, the prices are very high, but also the availability to recycle and reuse certain parts and those minerals is going to become very, very important because they're rare, they are not everywhere. So here's the life cycle of generation. You can read it later in your own time. But what is important from this slide that you have an energy mix that works for you. Certain companies will have a lot of spikes of energy when you need a lot of energy for certain parts of the production. And you need to be on a grid that can respond to that need for your organization. If you're on the service side, you more or less need always the same amount of energy because that's what how an office works. The energy mix is key. How you control your scope two emissions, in which you have a bit more control than scope three, because the scope three are the ones from your suppliers. And in some cases, your suppliers may be very remote and the energy mix of what they have. Let's think about a supplier in India. Many of our suppliers in India will always need generators on site that work with diesel, that work with petrol. Some of them may work with gas. The problem with it is, yes, they have a problem with the power, the power. Sometimes they don't have power 24 hours and they need those generators to supply what you need. So it's very important to know that. And then when you can have a gen energy generation from your point of consumption and doesn't need transmission, then actually you're winning because during the transmission between the generation and the consumption, there are losses. We're not gonna go into that into it, but depending on the system, the losses can go from 20% to 40%. And that is because we generate an amount, we lose during the, trans the transformation at several, and depending on the distance, you actually may even lose more. So on-site generation maximizes efficiency. So even if you think that putting a few solar panels will not make the difference, it actually may do. So let's go now very well into organizations and let's think on organizations and how and how can they how can they do to be better and what are the drivers so look at this another question where is more energy wasted i give you here a series of options i'm going to go through a couple of slides let you think about it but do you think it's buildings producing energy, so the generation itself, uh, the food systems, transportation, waste disposal, any other industrial processes or any other that you may think. So when you think about inefficiencies, it may be very unique to your situation and your organization. In some cases, you know, you may not even have an idea, but just think in general, where is more energy wasted? And then we're going to speak about it. The United Nations Industrial Development Organization calculates as an average that globally 40% of the industry energy demand is wasted. I'm going to go into it. This changes a lot between developing countries and developed countries. In some systems, you will see, uh, you, in every country, you will see a very different profile about where this energy demand is wasted. So we produce a lot, and because the grid is not good, 
we may produce it very well, but we cannot distribute it. In some countries in the industry, they may use very efficiently, efficiency, the uh, efficient, the energy that they demand. They produce, they produce very well, and the output per unit is actually acceptable. However, because there is no infrastructure correct to transport it, they may have to take a very long route or a different, a very energy intensive system, such as road transport, that compared with an electric train will be very big impact, and longer routes to actually get to a certain place. So we have seen that now with the war, um, well, the war in Ukraine, I want to see the invasion of Ukraine. Um, we actually have to change several routes that take longer, but you cannot pass certain cargo through Ukraine right now. So here I made you an energy efficiency map for several organizations. We have spoken already about the change of the economic model at a macro level, but actually will change also for you. At an organizational level, we will also need to change how we think about energy and the efficiency of each one of our products. We have uh, there a little poll that says Internet of Things, and that is how things are connected to the network and how things will be able to be controlled in a more central way. That may be a very good point to actually create efficiencies within organizations. And then how we think about our buildings and the design process. When we design a process, when we design a building, when we design our company service and products, we will need to think about energy efficiency. The price of energy will not be cheap forever. And even in some regions that right now are very cheap, that will change. So, is there one size fits all for energy efficiency? Well, no. <laughs> it depends on your industry sector, what are your main secondary support activities, and then other interdependencies that we, you will need. For example, in some companies, we buy products from an associated company to us or something that we part own or fully own in a different country that has an energy mix that is very intensive in the carbon emissions. Now, we can also, also think about location. So location and energy will become very important. The skills that you need within your organization, if the skills exist in the market, and especially in the market when you're importing from or bringing things from, and then the culture and management of the organization. So what are the wastage and efficiency in organizations? That slide that I asked you before. The first one is a standby consumption things that they are left on running overnight. Protocol deviations, when you have a procedure but people don't follow because X excuse. Leakages, we're not checking on the leakages, then the system has to compensate. Pure insulation, a similar, pro a similar profile. Non-efficient machinery because we don't service, because someone in finance came and says instead of four services, four service days a year, we're going to have two, and that creates that the machinery works much harder, and then obviously behavioral. But there is one missing in that list, and that is when the price of energy is too low, the energy efficiency measures go down on the agenda of management. So it becomes non-material. There is no pinch. We really don't take care of it right now. When the time comes, actually, we may even, when the time is right, when the time comes, I will actually, I will actually react then. But you have to be proactive, right? It's that kind of culture of the management. Are we proactive? Are we reactive? So think here about the subsidies. Subsidies actually reward consumption and wastage. Standby consumption. Typical example, monitors left on overnight. Monitors left on over four day weekends, the lights left on all night, et cetera, et cetera. Standby consumption can be up to 40% of the annual energy invoice. And that depends on what type of organization you are. For offices, that impact may go to 15%, but actually for industrial systems, it may go all the way to 40%. Now, protocol deviation. I have decided that that's beautiful procedure that does not apply for us because it's much easier to do it this way. Someone decides at factory floor level and that creates energy losses, wastage, and actually it represents peaks of energy and then peaks of energy in the majority of the energy contracts will be penalized. 
for which it means that you're actually using much more energy and paying much more than what it costs. So here you have an energy prices map. Now, mind you, this is the global price of energy per country, and in is that is for households. This is from New York Life Investment. It's actually from 2022. So you can see the price of inflation for energy in companies, usually something like three quarters or half the price that you can see there. Because depending on the contract, you buy larger amounts. So you pre-buy certain amount and then later you pay over that. So the price may be actually be very much lower what you pay per kilowatt. But here you have, you have countries and the majority of them are actually very cheap. Some of them, the energy is subsidized to such level that actually there is no pinch price. You may even not feel that this is very important. However, this needs to change and hopefully it will change as a policy outcome. It always makes sense to use less, right? But what we're looking here today is at efficiency and wastage. And that will be a low hanging fruit from any, for any EHS manager to actually find solutions and make space in the budget for other things that you may want to invest in. So this is always a low hanging fruit. Let's continue with these six points. Leakages, pneumatic hydraulic and pressurized systems have to reach certain levels to work. And that usually demands a built up of energy. If they are not properly optimized, and they are not properly maintained, and they're not properly calibrated, those systems can actually demand a huge spike of energy that later you have to pay. Poor insulation is the same. A lot of the machinery, just an air condition in an office, actually works by the heat transfer exchanges. And if that insulation actually is not working well, well, then what happens? You're actually paying more. And non-efficient motors, Maintain your systems. We know it in environment, we know it in health and safety. Maintenance is key for things to run efficiently. And you need the right skills. This is not as simple, simple as reading the, the manufacturer instructions, but you actually need this, this, the, uh, sorry, the, the proper skills and training and the proper supplier to do this for you. Let's go into solutions. You can run a natural accounting if someone tells you that that does not have an impact on budget. Actually, putting a price to nature, that many companies are doing it now, actually includes the externalities, the things that we don't pay a price for, but actually may have a price. There is a lot of help on that, on the uh, carbon, uh, in the carbon disclosure project, in the one reporting, you have a lot of things in the internet that can help you to put a price of how much actually the price of energy subsidized in certain countries would actually cost. My recommendation to make your life easier, Take, take the price that is most expensive in all your facilities and use that price as the real price for all of them. Then you can create a maximum, a minimum, and an average. Standby consumption, automatic controls. When you can, re, when you can get the human out of the equation and systems can do it for you, try to do it. Sensors, whatever it is, and then always, you have to think about the behavior chain. If someone left a computer on overnight, you actually can get a pink balloon, a yellow balloon, whatever color, you can stick it to there and then start putting balloons in your office. You will see in one week, no one will ever again in their life forget a system on. Protocol. Some people get bogged down in really long, impossible to follow procedures. If people deviate from protocols, it's because they find it very complex. And this is once again, a cultural change in the management. Are we thinking top down or are we thinking bottom up? Involve your stakeholders, speak with them, how you can make it simple. And sometimes the people that write the protocol actually have nothing to do. They do not know actually how the machines work. And those protocols should be clear and simple and to the point. And with their responsibilities, you actually can give an incentive. The team, the most saved uh, energy this year was so-and-so. One of the big changes that you will have always is the intermediate measuring of electricity consumption or energy consumption. And then publish that transparently. 
everyone can see it in a monitor. They can see right now how much energy are we using, how much, who is the team that's actually using less. And obviously, compare them by categories. You cannot compare an office to the factory floor. That would be very unfair. Leadership supervision, spot checks, that helps a lot. And people that actually is involved in the top management that says we want to run our company efficient and we want that inputs and outputs actually are efficient and we maximize the energy that we buy. The program maintenance for leakages and efficiency motors etc is actually very important but do not discard visual checks. When you see a puddle of oil somewhere there is something going wrong, Some, something is leaking and many times that goes ignored they just throw the spill kit on it, they clean it and they forget about it. So you need to know the root cause of your leakages and what they keep happen happening. One of the big things that we find is when suppliers come to do a service, they don't just put the insulation, they run out of time, and then they left you there wasting your own money. Insulation, key, keep changing it, keep having it like new. The systems should always be insulated. Uh, yes, it's just also you have fire and fugitive emission risk that with insulation, that may be actually helped. Regular maintenance sensors are a major thing. And uh, when you can have sensors, you can see what the spikes in the system are and actually can detect earlier when a system is not working well and to the design. So always very important. Now, I wanted to today speak a bit about energy management systems, but I don't want to go a lot into it because if you have an ISO 14001 uh, European um, eco, eco management audit scheme from the EU, you actually will be doing something on energy. But energy management systems are very good when the level of energy consumption is material to your budget and your organization. And it's actually a very good thing to conquer, but I don't think it's the first system I will always go for. However, it's not because I'm doing this. I'm, as a consultant, I always look that the companies have a solution that works for them. Energy management systems have the same structure as the quality, health and safety, and environment. And you will have, you know, what even whatever is needed for companies is exactly the same there. You will need to put a focus on an energy management system. It actually is material to your organization. Otherwise, just included in any other environmental management system or business continuity system that you may have. Now, what you can do to improve is very good. What you can have is KPIs, but will you not have all that in other systems as well? You can do an energy management system without going for ISO 50001. You can do an energy management system that works for your company. You design it, you follow it up, and remember, there's always a policy there's always a procedure or a number of them, and then there is a performance, and then you improve on all of those. This is a simple overview of an energy management system, exactly the same, exactly the same as any other of the management systems. And you know, you can read there in your own time this slide later on, but really it's exactly the same. So if you already have it, try to create it for yourself, and then down the line. If you actually, the price of energy becomes a pinch and is actually a complex organization that can actually would benefit from this, then go for it. But otherwise, just include it in the other ones. Then optimizing solutions. How do you present solutions to your management? You have here a very simple likelihood by consequence risk profile. Just you can think about financial impact versus environmental impact, if that is something for your organization. Some organizations actually do not think of, about their environmental impact as a reason or as a drive, but here some companies do. So just think about it, if that is the best, best way. Then you have also energy consumption versus productivity. That could also be another way to present it upward. And then the cost of a procedure plus, uh, sorry, versus the output. So if this procedure costing us too much money because it's too complex, no one is following it, so then we can scrap it or make it simpler or just sort it in an other way. And then the input of energy, how much kilowatts are coming through the door and what is the energy they use for each product and what is the wastage in the middle. You can do that doing a life cycle assessment. A simple one actually will suffice. 
Now, what is your organization? Is and um, the culture of your organization will change a lot how you think about how to present it upwards and downwards. So here you have companies that they are innovators, companies that they are early adopters, and then everyone that follows because the law says so. And then you have laggards. Laggards are usually people that find a compliance culture as the best way to go about. And this is not about the size of the organization, don't get me wrong. They are very small organizations that when they think lean, when they want to be innovators, they can actually design this in how they do. Actually, I always think that small organizations and big organizations should think like a small one. They are leaner and they can change much faster because the decision chain of command is much shorter. So then between a project is proposed and is approved, usually the times are shorter. The early adopters invest in new technology. They understand the power of certification or even doing systems internally and realize the potential in efficiency. And efficiency is a cultural thing. It's not only in energy, it's also in how you take decisions, in how you make things happen and as fast, and how you react to market forces and those macro factors that we were speaking about. With that, I finished today the presentation. I'm gonna speak two seconds about my organization so you know who we are. One of the big things that I will tell you is find champions. You will find a lot of people that they are in the most unconspicuous positions in your organization and they will be champions with you. The higher up, the better, the lower, the better, because when you find people that work in factory floor and they want to change something and they have good ideas that you may not have visibility on, they can be fantastic people to help you. Find easy wins, then just say, okay, these are my easy wins. I'm gonna administer them to show, you know, in case that something fails in the future, I can say, oh, listen, this failed, but actually we saved money or we created a better process here. And we actually make shorter the life cycle of a product, saving X amount on output, being energy, being environmental impact, whatever it is. Collect information. If you have information, we know information is power. Always create an impact profile. You can call it a business case. You can call it whatever it is. The impact can be monetary for people, for the planet, for your neighbors, whatever it is in the agenda, use that to create your impact. Materiality analysis. If energy actually is a pinch for your organization, give them a solution. And communication strategy, always win hearts and minds. You have to present two types of information. The first one, qualitative. This is what we're gonna save. And the second one is quantitative, uh, sorry, it's quantitative and qualitative. I, I said it the other way around. Qualitative to win the hearts and minds, quantitative. Just always say we can create, we can decrease our impact by doing this, but we actually are doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And then your technical solutions well researched. There is a lot of technical innovation out there, but only a few work actually well for your organization. Now, this is the end of the presentation, maybe the beginning of your journey. In any case, let me speak about two slides about organization, Hillman Associates. I work with them and a senior consultant with them. Uh, what we do is health, safety, environment, the management systems. For the UK, we especially do lifting plans, but we specialize in a lot in behavior. We have two tools, the e-colors on the arrow, that actually work with a, a color profiling that we do and this is a system that has been developed since the 80s and we represent here in the uk and in europe and we have a free cap analysis tool for everyone to use these are a few of our clients and uh, it's a small company we're about 10 of us with a few more associates here and there wherever we are needed um, we try to work with people in finding solutions. We don't really like big systems. We like simple systems that go to the point and our sweet spot is usually with SMEs. Actually, not always. With Heathrow, we work a lot in health and safety and creating those behavioral programs that help them. The e-colors is about how teams work better together. And for management, how to find, how to find how each one of my workers will be played to a strength. So then we don't waste time on things that people may be finding hard to do or making them people that may feel uncomfortable to do. It's also, we use it as a risk management tool. 
we coach and improve over a period of time the teams a lot of the local government are actually jumping into this in a couple of countries and we're finding it very useful for them how to make people much more engaged engage with the work that they do uh, with the team that they work and smoothing out problems that may actually be behavioral but by understanding them well we actually can deliver much better results and we have a quality tool with for that called aero it's actually fantastic i encourage you everyone to, to try it and that yes is the end of my presentation back to you alison thank you so much everyone Sounds good. Thank you very much, Nico. Um, so we have just under 10 minutes for some questions. If you'd like to write them in the question box, then um, I will read them out. Um, just starting with, so you mentioned carbon capture, which just sounds incredible, the idea that you can sort of bury this carbon dioxide or, or, or transform it into an industrial material that can be useful. How is that happening now? Or is that something for the future? What, what, what stage is that at? And is this yes. going to really make a difference? Yes, yes, we are retrofitting uh, at the moment. They are retrofitting a lot of the current big emitters. So when you have a carbon, a waste to energy, so any solid fuel, we need to use carbon capture to comply, especially with the European, Swiss, UK standards on emissions. So this is happening right now. Uh, some of the gases that they actually take are, the, so just to give you an idea, so at the moment we were we've been developing systems in the last five years. Let's put a comparative. We could capture 85% um, with ash and different systems that captured on the flue gas treatment. Now the releases are down to 3%, and the European Union is telling us that is a lot. So we are actually capturing that carbon and try to putting it into different industrial uses. Not all gases are useful. Some of it we make it solid. Some of it we mix it into uh, with carbon, sorry, we mix it with other chemicals to make it actually liquid. Some of them have industrial applications, others are stored. So it's not the best solution, but it's what we have right now. The important thing at the moment, a lot of organizations are finding that there is a big pinch there because we need to capture it to comply with emissions. And after that, we'll see what happens. Okay. Um, so you mentioned uh, 50,001 ISO as a, a management system. Um, are there many other management systems out there? What, what else is there? Yes, so there are quite a few systems out there that you can use. As I said, environmental management systems could identify the materiality of your energy consumption or your energy wastage as something that you need to tackle in your aspects and impact register however you have the eco-management scheme of the eu uh, there is some bs standards and european norms and there are also a lot of local standards that actually relate to the legis uh, to the local legislation so in some countries netherlands china vietnam they have very unique systems that work with their legislation. So once you are actually uh, complying with, on the same way that if you do ISO 50001, you actually comply with the ESOS regulations, some countries have exactly the same. So you have to look what is local. You know, I have a list somewhere there if someone wants it, they can ask. Um, but there are a lot of systems out there. 50001 is your voluntary system. In others, you have third party checks that are a bit stringent and they may even demand to put sensors in some of your emissions. So it's really what works for you, what works for your organization, and what is the objective. Um, thinking about the supply chain, um, I, I guess that's where a lot of the, environment, uh, the energy impact is, um, and mm -hmm. potentially the, the hardest to get at. Do you have any tips about working with suppliers and encouraging them to um, join you in the energy efficiency journey and so the supply chain will have the same macro macro pressures like you plus one more which is their clients are going to say you have to deliver x with this amount of energy accounted for it so a lot of the suppliers actually are going to suffer the biggest shift companies in china vietnam southeast asia latin america are already accounting for this now, mind you, over there, the energy is cheap. 
And then what happens? So they don't have such a big pressure. That's why they will have one macro factor to account for, which is the emission, the scope three for emissions is really a big question and, and, and it's being tackled right now. We're starting, but we're still very green on it. And um, a lot of the companies self declarations, when I go to my clients and I look for it, I, I just cannot believe what they say they deliver with what they deliver. And if we don't put an even play field for everyone to actually be able and to feel with the transparency and the culture to say, I can actually declare this. I can actually declare this without feeling that I'm going to be punished for it or I'm going to lose the contract. That is very important. So a lot of the skills and knowledge transfer between the client and the supply chain will have to happen. And also to create that space where there is a collaboration in which we can work together to see how we can improve your operation. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're going towards a, a technology um, increasingly important uh, within our society um, and using data centers. Uh, mm -hmm. These are meant to use a heck of a lot of energy. Do you have anything to say about that as a direction from going from, I don't know, going towards cloud, so going from having your servers on site to going to on cloud where it's this vast um, number of data centers? Computers? How much time I have? No, well, I'm going to give you a one minute answer. But this is the technology of data centers have radically changed in the last five years. With COVID, we saw a total improvement of an adoption of new technologies within data centers. To give a comparative, a few years back, we had to run all the data centers at 23 degrees constant. Now, new technology have much bigger amplitude on the, on the temperature they can run. So actually, even today's it, when we have summer days of 35 degrees, they can run with the same efficiency. So that on one side. Before also we used to cool or heat up the data centers to a certain temperature, 23 degrees was usually the sweet spot, and the megabyte that we can get of data that we could get was much lower. Once again, improvements in technology, the amplitude in, in technology, and how they work the systems with each other, actually have created a lot of efficiency. So data centers as well. Some companies have data centers because of the products and services they provide. So there is a lot of uh, fear about the attacks and cyber attacks. So then they keep the data center instead of going for a cloud solution. Cloud solutions are much more efficient because a lot of people buy from them so that energy they use per byte of output are actually much lower. So what happens if you keep it in-house, in you may actually find yourself that you're spending a lot of energy. I have experience of some of my clients, they actually went into cloud and they started saving money. And we're speaking to the tune of 10% annually. Neither Microsoft, neither Amazon, neither Google Cloud, neither of those companies ever suffered an attack. So it is uh, while well, some data may be stolen in different platforms, so the software at the front of the data centers, it has never happened in the data centers. It's something to consider. It depends once again on the culture of the IT team uh, of your organization, but there is a lot to be win to first transfer certain things to cloud computing and others to just uh, ensure the technology is the latest so you get the most efficient energy, uh, energy consumption from it. That's really good to hear. Okay, we've come to the end of our session. Thank you very okay. much, Nico. That was really interesting. I'm <laughs> certainly going to have to go back through and look at your slides, and, and uh, there was a lot of information on there, um, but I feel much better informed now. So thank you for sharing that with us, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, thank okay. you. Bye. Bye.